Do come in. Thank you very much. You come very highly recommended <laughs> by Her Royal Highness. The demand for domestic staff is now higher than ever. I couldn't run this place without my staff. You know, just cleaning the windows here takes ages. <laughs> Whether behind the gates of Britain's stately homes. I'm probably the only person over 50 with my nanny on site. Or just for those with the cash to splash, there are staff to cater to every whim. I'd like them to learn how to make a proper martini. Is the glass chilled? Everybody in life needs to remember what their role in life is. They're there to serve. In this series, we follow the cream of society in their search for the very best domestic help. The last handyman, unfortunately, left, but he took the lady of the house with him. As well as the candidates who dream of working for them. Fingers close. <laughs> I got it. From the exacting interviews... Do you have a chainsaw certificate? Uh, no, but that was my Easter plan. <laughs> to those terribly tough recruitment decisions. Helen's big fault is she's so very pretty. <laughs> because as everyone knows, finding good staff is the hardest job of all. He looks like he just come off the street. You do something to my dogs, I do something to your cat. Forget about anything that comes out of their mouth at the interview. They'll tell you anything. It's all lies. Don't believe anything. The early 1900s was the pinnacle of the master-servant relationship, when the staff knew exactly where they stood. Good shot, sir, Ben! In the modern era, the hierarchy is less clear-cut. I don't want to waste your time by saying I'm really, really, really desperate for the job. Struggling with the staff this week is a lady of the house who's having to muck in. I would imagine if somebody walked past the door now and saw me cleaning, they wouldn't think when I was a Leslie Williams. As her groundsman won't toe the line... We suggested he retire and he stormed in and said he would die if we forced him to retire. What's this all about? How are your little legs? On foreign shores, an American gentleman is interviewing to place a housekeeper. Hello. Hello, Mr. Riggle. Nice meeting you. Nice to meet you. But instead is shown the way by a British thoroughbred butler. I am in a difficult situation right now. Actually, Ryan is doing I'm going to correct you. You're not right. in a difficult situation. As a principal, he's got a lot to learn. And the owner of a castle in need of grand assistance with his moat. You wouldn't get a great deal of change from about £100,000. No, that's way over the budget I had in mind. But who is not prepared to pay a king's ransom for it? Basically, I'm mean. Um, but then maybe that's why I'm living in a castle. Chavenage House in Gloucestershire has been in the Lowesley Williams family for the past 169 years. Its current incumbent is David Lowesley Williams, who received the Elizabethan Manor House as a charming little wedding present from his uncle in 1958. I've always said I could never move either houses or wives. <laughs> it's too much hassle. A wise rule. Having lived his life by it, David, who's now in his 80s, and wife Rona are still sitting tight at Chavenage, while their eldest daughter of three children, Caroline, keeps the estate ticking over. Um, talking of my father, that is Dad, the portrait there. Uh, Dad's thrilled with it. To help put money in the pot, Chavenage welcomes tours, events and weddings, all marshalled by Caroline and her small team. Anyway, come and have a look inside. But ensuring her parents remain free to roam, in their dressing gowns if they so wish, means Caroline has a delicate balancing act. Thomas, that's your favourite, it's Jesse Smith's. Oh, thanks. Oh, fine. Fine. And I've done some salad. Oh, well done. It is Mum and Dad's home, and I see my job is really to not see them out, that sounds rather terminal, but um, make sure that they can live happily in the house as a home. I feel I've moved on the business from here to here. I think... Dad certainly thinks we're actually too commercial. I mean, I don't think we're commercial enough. She has more modern ideas than I do. But at the same time, it's not her place. Mummy and Daddy aren't the only potential sticking point for Caroline in her plans for the estate. Currently, the workforce at Chavenage consists of a grand total of two permanent members, with a glorious combined age of 145. This is Della, and you came to Chavenage when you were... 
um, six years old. What was your original title? Um, nanny. Nan well, Nanny Girl. Wasn't nanny it? Girl, yeah. I'm probably the, the only person over 50 with my nanny on site. When I came, um, there were three ladies um, here cleaning in the house. There was a cook and a butler. I didn't realise I would be here so long. I think they might be lost if I wasn't here, yes. <laughs> While nimble 72-year-old Della does a marvellous job in the house, the Lone Ranger battling against 2,000 acres is groundsman Paddy, who's been at it since 1966. Paddy? Hello. I was only four when you came. Yeah, yeah. He's a newbie. Only, only 48 years. <laughs> And, and what are the family going to do, Paddy, when you decide to retire? Who's going to retire? <laughs> You've got no chance of that. They'll have to carry me out. <laughs> we feel hugely loyal to Paddy. He really has given his life to Chavenage. But I think walking is becoming a bit of an issue. But he's brave. He would never admit that, that he's in pain. For Caroline, making up the shortfall around the estate consists of tasks not traditionally associated with the lady of the manor. I would imagine if somebody walked past the door now and saw me cleaning, they wouldn't think that I was a Leslie Williams. It is tough. I spend a lot of time car parking. I spend quite a lot of time brushing up leaves, clean floors, clean the ladies' loose. Can you unload it by yourself? Yeah, I, I, I can manage that. <laughs> So Caroline is considering what may be seen as an unpopular staffing shake-up. We've got to accept that we've got to bring in younger people to, to keep the sort of wheels turning, I suppose. Across the pond, the Americans have an even bigger penchant for hiring staff than we British. Over there, three quarters of a million people are in the business of bringing a little more civility. In Baltimore, aspiring composer Andrew Rieger, or Drew in American, is hoping to employ one of that number. While music has always been his grand passion, Mr. Rieger made his fortune in a less romantic way, namely IT and property. Most of my life I've had to work in a 9 to 5 type job. I've always been involved in music, like I'd work a day job at an office and at night I'd go work for an orchestra. And composition was always neglected. Finally I just came to the conclusion that I had to make a major change in my life. When I was sitting in an office I felt a little more of me die every day. Happily, Andrew now makes his pocket money by renting out his 11 properties, and so devotes his time to composing symphonies and chamber pieces. My brain just doesn't start working normally until around 10 in the morning. And this is pretty typical of, of, of the great composers. But his hopes of joining their ranks are rather compromised by also having to manage his 10,000 square foot six-story home. So he's decided to take action and hire a housekeeper. There's 47 windows in the house, so it takes about 20 minutes a day to open and close the drapes. I'm going around, moving things, tidying up things, and I must walk 10 miles in this house every day. Naturally, inviting a stranger to live in to draw the curtains, etc., does come with its downsides. Someone is going to know my most intimate habits, and so I really need uh, someone I can fully trust. Dashing to Drew's assistance is Andrew Lowry former butler to the Saudi royal family, who now runs an elite staffing agency. And best of all, he's British. The positions that I, that I fill with my company range from chefs, butlers, personal assistants, estate managers. And I think a lot of people come to me because I am British, have that formal training. Andrew once attended the very prestigious Ivor Spencer Butler School. So he's well placed to teach the Americans a thing or two. It, it, it's ceremonial, the whole art of serving tea. It sounds pathetic to a lot of people, but it's magical to me. Today, Andrew is bringing his charming bag of tricks to Drew's not-so-humble home to mull over his staffing requirements. Andrew! How are you? It's me. It's Come me. in, please. So, I recall the, the, the phone call that you made to me. I guess you were somewhat hesitant about admitting that you need help for this beautiful home. I just can't do it all anymore. I've realized right. um, 
that it's just too much. What's the most important thing that you're looking for in this individual? I would say resourcefulness because a home like this constantly needs care. I mean, you obviously you have fine antiques and furnishings. <laughs> I have a lot of valuable things, so whoever would work here would have to be someone that I implicitly trust. So Andrew, this is my humble little two-story kitchen with my great wall of china here. Spectacular. It, the china goes all the way up to the second floor. He knows what he wants. Highly educated. I'm very confident that I should be able to supply some resumes to him and uh, have him on his desk by the morning. I'm excited about making this placement. I really am. It's, it's, uh, it's refreshing, actually. Brailsham Castle in Sussex. Its turrets are enough to fluster any young damsel. But this is no historical monument. In fact, it was planned and completed in 2001 by Professor John Mew. It's an unspoilt site in a beautiful valley in an area of outstanding natural beauty. What can I build that will actually make that valley look more beautiful? So I thought, well, it, it will have to be a castle. This British adventurer is no one-trick pony. He's a professor of orthodontics, an author, and he broke the Formula One lap record at Brands Hatch in 1963, but apparently none of those vacations could fund John's vision. I didn't have any money. I had to borrow it and scrape and save to build it. The whole idea of um, building this castle in the first place was for the reward I got from it. And to be truly honest, I think I enjoy living here, partly because of the status it gives me. I enjoy being the man who lives in the castle. It took Professor Mew eight years of hard graft to erect the castle that was home to him and his wife Jo for almost 20 years. Sadly, John was recently widowed and now rattles around Brailsham alone. My children have suggested I move out, but no, I want to die here. At 85, thankfully, John himself shows no sign of shuffling off this mortal coil yet, especially when he has a castle to maintain. He does have his man Friday, Brian, to bring some muscle, though. He is a mere 75. I mean, I've been coming down here on and off now for 12 years, I suppose, and uh, if John wants something done, I'll get stuck in and do it. If he can help, he does. I was only, what, 60 when I moved in, and um, that was 20 years ago. So, yes, you've seen me slow right up recently, haven't you, Brian? Yeah, yeah. When John's wife was alive, she used to be the planner. And then John and I were the doers. Um, we don't plan quite as well now. Perhaps the most epic example of Professor Mew's planning is the castle's crowning glory, the moat. My wife gave me a digger. Very useful things, especially for gardening. And it took me very nearly two years to build out the whole of this lake. But ten years after completion, the moat is not as his wife would have known it, due to a massive build-up of silt. So John is having to consider looking for outside help to bring it back to its glorious past. So we're getting contractors in to discuss the various possibilities, but I'm worried about the cost primarily. I, I think it's really important that I can still enjoy it for a while longer yet. As a great woman once said, books are the carriers of civilization. One should never allow dust to settle in your library. It deteriorates the bindings and displays ignorance. So to keep your collection civilized, every month your housekeeper should remove the first four books from the highest shelf and apply a sable brush. Dust the vacant opening and continue along the length of the shelf. Librarians are sticklers for order, so ensure the books are returned in sequence. It may be an arduous job, but remember, Rome wasn't built in a day.
Baltimore, USA, where composer Drew Rieger is looking to hire his first housekeeper to tend to his 14-bedroom, six-story home so he can concentrate on making beautiful music. So I brought copies of their resumes. Fortunately, he has help to find his help. Thoroughly British staffing agent and former royal butler Andrew Lowry, who's been shortlisting applicants for the $20 an hour job for Mr. Rieger's assessment. I've known Terry for many years. I've placed her in a number of super duper positions. And Terry, I heard you say, is a she. Because Terry, Terry yes. can also be a he. Correct. Okay, Terry good. is a she, yes. <laughs> the aforementioned Terry Ridgely boasts 18 years' experience keeping house in private homes across Baltimore. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. Why don't you have a seat here? All right. Today, Drew is to meet a range of candidates before inviting two favorites back for a practical interview tomorrow. You probably noticed that this house is very long. And it's very tall. There's lots was, of steps. I, I was <laughs> noticing the height. You would have to go from the first to the, the basement to the sixth floor for this job, so... And I'm assuming you're, you're not mentioning an elevator. There is no <laughs> elevator, no. Are you familiar with this book? Emily Post? Yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> you are, so... <laughs> this is kind of my trick question. One of my very of first books. Oh, very yes. good. <laughs> Emily Post was kind of the doyen or grand dame of etiquette in America. And I think that, that we are seriously suffering from a lack of civility in the world right now. So reading the 1920 edition of Emily Post Etiquette, I think, would be a very good thing for someone working in this household to do. She fits the bill of, um, you know, my initial need to have a slightly, let's say slightly older woman who would be nurturing to me. I think she has that type of personality. I see that come through right away. Did you detect po possibly a slight say, hesitation on the, the, when you mentioned about the stairs and the ability mm -hmm. to... Right, yes, I certainly picked slide. up on that. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Almost, say, almost 20 steps. Six flights, that's uh, carrying laundry, bed linens, you know, it might be quite taxing. It is a concern to me, I would have to say. At Chavenage House in Gloucestershire, Caroline Lowsley Williams is working her socks off to keep her estate in order. But she's facing an obstacle in her 73-year-old groundsman or certain bits of him anyway. I think he's in fair constant pain in his legs. Um, he hides it pretty well. We suggested he retired and he stormed in and said he would die if we forced him to retire. But I have been thinking about it and I would like somehow to arrange a slight change of the guard. Paddy has so far proved unwilling to take on an apprentice but today, Caroline has summoned him for a frank conflap about his future. I mean, you might just turn around and say, we don't need you anymore. That could happen. I would miss it. I suppose, but time comes when you've got to give it up. You want to take a seat? Thank you. <laughs> What's this all about? I thought you might ask. It's really... Um... I've looked at quite a lot of jobs that need to be done. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to make a sort of plan of how we're going to get around and do, do them. And I just really... Um, what was it, right? Everyone's getting older. And there's quite a lot... I mean, I don't think I'm up to <laughs> lifting a lot of logs and things. I mean, I know you... Yeah. There's one or two other quite sort of... It would require quite a lot of lifting and things like that. And then... What I was really thinking was that, you know, I, I don't think I've got the time, but whether we could get somebody who could sort of help, not, I mean, who could help you, really, rather than you help them. So, so I mean, it's certainly not pushing, you, you know, you out of a job or anything like that. Well, the help would be something, anyway. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I'm not sure. How are your little legs? Oh, my little legs are all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a funny feeling she might have wanted to say something about me getting older. Probably a bit slower, but never any fear anybody taking over my job. <laughs> Right, I'll see you later. Okay. All right. Whew. I mean, I always thought if I had that sort of conversation with Paddy, I was rather wishing him dead because, uh, but I was certainly not doing that. Yes, I mean, I actually feel there's a slight weight lifted off my shoulders. Right. It's rather like putting down an old dog. 
in a way, it's your privilege to be able to do it. And, you know, you can still let the dog enjoy it up to the last moment. Um, but it's very difficult to make a decision when that last moment is. In Baltimore, staffing agent Andrew Lowry and composer Drew Rieger are interviewing potential housekeepers to work in his million-dollar townhouse. They have met one candidate already. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. Next to encounter his potential principal is rather dashing 22-year-old Ryan Brubaker. Hey, Ryan. How are you? Nice to meet you. Recent graduate from Gallaudet in Washington, D.C., the only university in the world for the hard of hearing. So have you done any uh, service in a house no, before? No, I have not. No, you haven't? First time. First time, okay. You know, I noticed here that you went to Gallaudet, so you have a hearing impairment? Right, yeah, okay. yeah. But I have hearing aids and they help me hear you. Oh. So uh, without my hearing aids, I wouldn't be able to hear us talking right now. Part of the job is keeping a house like this clean. Looking around this room, that mirror over there is a big gilded mirror. Obviously, it's got fingerprints on it. But what about the gilding on the outside of it? I would polish, polish it up with some polish, I guess. I would, like I said, I really don't know much about antiques, and yeah. so before I touch something, I'd make sure I know what I'm doing. So the right answer is, I would ask, <laughs> and then remember. Before, before, before <laughs> you right. devalue de the frame by That's about right. $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. I think you have a lot of potential in this field. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Great. You went pretty well. I answered everything truthfully, and to the best of my ability. What are your immediate thoughts? Well, I'm no longer worried about his hearing impairment, mm -hmm. and he seemed to respond quite well. He's definitely a very handsome young man, and I could see my female guests at dinner <laughs> being quite taken by him. He's a contender for sure. Last to interview is Miriam Palandetti, a single mother of seven children who works as a cleaner in a private home. It's exhausting just thinking about it. So, you are currently a uh, housekeeper, house manager? Yes, sir. I go through the house and check and make sure everything is okay, there's nothing wrong with the home, and then I just go about my day and start cleaning and straightening up. What family commitments? I know you have a family of your own. Would you like to sort of paint the picture for Mr. Riga? I, I have seven children, mm -hmm. so I still, you know, drop off my children to work, school, and mm -hmm. pick them up. I mean, I can make my own coffee, <laughs> you know. I think it went okay. I was a little nervous, but I think all in all it, it went okay. I do believe I could get along very well with Mr. Regal and have a good relationship in the future. She seemed very capable of doing the job, but I worry about the fact that she has another job somewhere else and a large family. I don't know how she can juggle all of that. In Gloucestershire, developments are afoot. A month ago, it was put to long-serving groundsman Paddy that he might need to get used to sharing his workload. It was a bit of a shock to start with, but once we'd sat down and, and talked about it, he realised that it was a good thing. But I think he sort of forgot that he is 76, you know, because <laughs> he's always worked. It didn't occur to him that he was even pension age. <laughs> I am part of the family, more or less. We've always got on well together. I don't think they can do without me anyway. <laughs> to avert a mutiny, Caroline Lowsley Williams has put on her thinking cap and come up with an apprentice she feels will be ideal. Paddy has a grandson, Ryan, who has very much grown up on the estate. It would give him an incentive um, to, in a way, give up more work. Good boy. Joker. Right, Joker. You all right? His grandson, Ryan, is about to clock in. But Paddy isn't mellowing yet. I know he's my grandson, but he'll have to do it my way. He's all right. He'll learn. I can hear you right. coming from miles. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you hear your miles off. Well, you hear your miles off. Remember, she, she's getting quite deaf. Oh, okay. so she, I mean, even your bloody loud music, she went... Ah, she won't get troubled <laughs> by it. <laughs> Not to be perturbed, Caroline has plans for the new manpower to tend to a neglected pond, which Paddy's been unable to tackle alone. As you can see, everyone's used it as a dumping ground for years. 
Do you think I can leave you boys to do this? Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and don't yeah. let Paddy do too, uh, too much lifting. No, no, I won't. I'll keep an eye on them. The dear, old, the dear old soul. Dear old soul. Yeah. 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 Corner, will you? Yeah. Paddy's not the only stick in the mud at Chavenage, as Caroline is hoping a spot of lunch will also help ease her parents towards the idea of change. You know the duck pond at the Manor Farm? Yep. And it doesn't look at all nice. But anyway, I talked to Paddy about it, and actually it's really too much of a job, so I have asked Ryan in for the day. How much is that costing? Well, I've just got a day rate fixed with him. What, um, what was that? Well, he... he, he <laughs> I haven't quite finished my negotiation. What we yeah. don't want to happen is for Ron to think that he's got a permanent job whenever he wants it here. But it's, it's difficult because, I mean, obviously, I mean, Paddy's not going to be around forever. Um, but, I mean, I think the idea of expecting you and Mum to be cleaning loos at midnight after a function might be a thing of the past. Um, but, you know, it's just because, I mean, we're all getting older. A bit at a time, that's what the old lady said. <laughs> My parents there still think hiring a man in for a day is an expensive job. Um, I think it'd be nice to show them at the end and say we've had extra help in the day and this is what we can achieve. And, you know, obviously you don't get something for nothing, we've got to pay for it. Octogenarian Professor John Mew isn't letting his years get in the way of maintaining his mock 12th century castle that he built himself 20 years ago. I actually think a restful life is likely to be a short one. I really believe that the more you commit to yourself, that it helps you both to enjoy life more and live a longer life. He's an absolute trooper. But the build-up of silt in the moat just won't do. And although John's a hands-on sort of fellow, today he's decided to get an expert quote. Morning. Good morning. You can see the problem. The mm. silt has come down over the last couple, three years. So is it just that recently it started to come above the surface of the water? Yes, is it? Yeah. yeah. Probably a couple of hundred tonnes is there to move. Um, I would imagine there's significantly more, more than that. Doesn't sound that easy, John, <laughs> does it? No. <laughs> I think you'd better get out in your boat. I think we should. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then we can pursue the discussion yeah, when you've absolutely. got a few facts. Man Friday Barry wants to warn the boss about getting another of his grand ideas. It would take years doing it. Well, so. I can remember how long it took me to dig it out in the yeah, first place. Yeah. And I built the castle myself, and so I've got a, a lot of faith in uh, how much you can save by doing things yourself. Yeah. But um, these people are professionals, and they'll want a lot of money. And um, anything I can do to save it will be better. Yeah. I think my optimum uh, get out from the day would be that they would suggest a way in which we might clear it so that it's not going to need anything doing for another 10 years at a moderate price, and I mean under 10,000. Hello there. Hi. It's an awful lot of silt. From our approximations, um, we have got close to 10,000 tonnes in there, possibly right. 12,000. So, what are the options on reducing it? The machinery for pumping is incredibly expensive. Now, I will look, have you any idea of, of costs? I would say you wouldn't get a great deal of change from about £100,000. No, that's way over the budget I had in mind. Um, I, I thought I would get an expensive job for 20 grand and maybe a DIY job for 10. Yeah. So, as John can't afford the staff, he's left to ponder how to get the job done. There are lots of very wealthy people who think nothing of paying that to have a lake. Um, but as I made it myself, I believe it's my job to try and keep it clean myself. Three p.m. is a splendid time for a sharpener, and a dry gin martini is a gentleman's choice. This spirit performs best when kept below zero. Pour a three-quarter measure of your libation into a glass and tip over ice. Add a waft of dry vermouth and mix. Contrary to Mr. Bond, always stir, never shake. Strain into a chilled glass and dress with a solitary olive.
executed correctly one's ice-cold martini will slip down like a silk stocking. The day after the face-to-face -face interviews, Drew Rieger has invited back two potential candidates for a trial as his housekeeper. In contention are young whippersnapper Ryan and mum of seven, Miriam. So let's go to the dining room and uh, I'll show you what's going on there. Tonight, Drew will be hosting a dinner party for the cream of Baltimore society, and he wants his help to reflect well. Each get a door when we're ready and just open and then help the guests to their seats. Ryan and Miriam have at least four hours of preparation before they're required to stay and serve dinner at 9 p.m., but that's no excuse for carelessness. They're very valuable, so be very oh, careful with them. Okay. I wouldn't carry more than four because if you drop them all, then it's only, uh, you know, $1,200 worth of, versus $2,400 worth of plates that break. Okay. Whilst Ryan handles the 120-year-old China, Hi. Miriam has her own delicate situation to handle with staffing agent Andrew Lowry. Um, I wasn't aware that um, this was going to be an all-evening um, affair. Okay. And I have to actually obligated to pick up a couple of my kids. What I would suggest you do is go and pick up your kids. They're expecting you to pick them up. And if you are able to come back, then come back, okay? Okay, I will do my okay. best to get back. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I do apologize. Okay, okay. okay. bye-bye. Are you okay? I, I, I am. I'm a little stressed because I didn't know about the dinner tonight. Oh, really? I had no idea. Oh, I thought Andrew had spoken with you. He said, come back today for another interview. I another interview. I... Ah. So, would you be able to come back later, or are you... What time is your dinner party? It's, and... it's in an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> the earliest I could get back here would be like 9 o'clock. Oh, my. Regardless of whether it was Andrew's communication problem or hers, I don't know. I don't care. I'll just have to watch and see how she does later and see, see if she can make up for uh, the misunderstanding. With Miriam taking her leave, Drew is left in a pickle as he now has to rely entirely on Ryan, who has never served at a formal dinner before. A little pressure on me, but uh, there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's not worth, you know, stressing about it. You just gotta, just, just go, just keep moving. We'll see what happens. Oh, boy. Andrew, uh, I, I just found out that Miriam uh, isn't available to uh, help with the first part of the dinner. Do you think that you, you might be able to come over here and, and, um, and... I'm, I'm Andrew's house right now, so... Oh, great. Right over, okay? So you, you knew of the problem and, uh... Of course I didn't know about the problem. I do now, but I'll handle it, okay? Oh, you're ha Okay, well, great. Okay. Well, good. Bye. Yes, if you could help Ryan here, I'm helping him. <laughs> okay. He's on his way. <laughs> In Baltimore, Drew Rieger is on the hunt for his first ever housekeeper, but it's not quite going to plan. The bathroom above the kitchen in the back wing of the house uh, will be the uh, <coughs> staff bathroom. I'm not used to saying that. Candidate Miriam couldn't stay the course, so what luck. Instead, domestic staffing agent Andrew Lowry has rushed over to help Ryan, who, without any previous experience, is in unfamiliar territory. At least... Uh... You're going to have some help tonight. Andrew came right over. Great, great, so. great. <laughs> With a former royal butler overseeing preparations, Drew can concentrate on giving his guests his best. I'm beginning to see that Brian actually has a real take charge attitude. And it's amazing that he hasn't done this before, but he just seems to be a really bright guy and he seems to be able to listen and follow direction. I'm not really looking for someone who can do a formal dinner service. What I was looking for is resourcefulness. Perfect. Don't ever think it? Great. Mr. Rieger's guests arrive, at which point Ryan is expected to serve drinks and canapes until the host is ready to make his entrance. Uh, vodka on the rocks, please. Twist. Uh, what is it? Vodka. Vodka on the rocks. Twist. And Twist. Thank you. Please. Twist. Yeah. Thank you. Hey. Hello, Hello, Ernest. Hi, Skyla. You look lovely. Thank you. Good to see you. You look good, too. Hello. While the host hosts, Andrew adapts to being back on the front line. Is this the norm? Is that what you're trying to say? No, it's not the norm. I would never, ever 
making hors d'oeuvres and, and setting tables, but you guess what? It happens. However frantic things are in the kitchen, service should always be seamless. So Andrew instructs Ryan on the how-tos. So you're going to put Mrs. Nicholas's down first. Okay. Put them on the left. Right always, right always serve from the left, OK? I am astounded. When I looked at his resume, the most he had served was pizza. <laughs> and so, very, very pleased. Can I freshen your drink? Check yes, in. please. Ryan is proving a hit at dinner. But so are the $180 bottles of champagne. He ran out. He uh, ran out. out. Ran out. We're a little trick in the book, Ryan. We're going to pour this into the other bottle, <laughs> pretending that we have enough. Would they know? Would they know? Good. Would they? Know, would they? I don't think after a few drinks, I'm going to know, are they? <laughs> oh. To see people working behind the scenes, doing their job, and really attending to the guests and taking pride in the work that they do, it, it's so rewarding to me. Oh, okay. I see what you're doing. It's our secret. Nobody's going to know. Well, people don't know, it won't hurt them, right? You know what, Ryan? That's the sweetest thing you've said all day. <laughs> Problem solved. But it's 9.30, and Andrew receives news from Miriam about her return. Mr. Eager, yes. I just wanted to let you know, um, I actually just called Miriam. Yes. Essentially to make sure she got home safely. Right. Which well, she did. She only actually got home literally five minutes ago. Um, is she coming back? She did not say that she was on her way back. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's a deal breaker for me. Well, it really is because I, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I am in a difficult situation right now. And Actually, Ryan is doing his I'm going best. to correct you. You're not right. in a difficult situation. Well, you have stepped up to help and Ryan. And that's what happened. That's right. And, and, you, you, and you, if I may interject, yes. <laughs> if I may interject, mm -hmm. foremost thing was there was a slight miscommunication. Yeah. All I can say is we will discuss this later. Sure. Go and enjoy your guests yes. for the next course, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I'm disappointed because um, I really do need someone who's available. And um, I'm beginning to see that you know, maybe she was taking on more than she could handle. For the staffing agent, it's a more complicated issue. Clients sometimes need education, and things happen. It wasn't because she didn't want to be here. She would have made provisions to have had her children picked up, and I don't think she should be crucified for that. You know, as a principal, he's got a lot to learn. Um, if I may quote, uh, excuse me, Mr. Riga, there's an Emily Post book somewhere in your library. Possibly take a look. Enough said. When one has built one's own castle, problems come with the territory. At Brailsham in Sussex, Professor John Mew is literally surrounded by his. Water may look beautiful and aesthetically, I think is essential for a setting like this, but it is inevitably hard work. When he did try to delegate for someone to tackle the 10 years of silt build-up, Professor Mew was quoted £100,000, no mere drop in the moat. So instead, he's getting hands-on himself. Every job I've done comes up with problems that we haven't appreciated. But that's part of the challenge of life, isn't it? Where will we all be without challenge? Although John is not attacking his main water feature today, he is focusing on the stream which runs from the moat. It may only be a Tuesday, but Man Friday Brian and his grandson Ollie have been collared to assist. Uh, there we are. My legs are very wobbly. I don't often fall over. I'm sometimes surprised how infrequently I do fall over. John's 85-year-old pins aren't quite what they once were, but he's not about to let that stop him operate a five-ton digger through some precarious woodland. I'm just faintly concerned about falling that way because... Um, yeah, well, why not back off and level the hump out a bit? Be a bit careful of your head, Ollie. I would think that everybody who owns a large garden would do with a digger. They're jolly useful things. All right, a bit big for cabbages, but you can still roll them around a bit. They're also handy for rebuilding the sides of one's sluice. Hold it! That's enough! Yeah! 
Don't scratch the paint. <laughs> I, I think if I ask people to repair this, they're going to be charging me five, maybe ten grand. And um, we've done it for a couple of hundred or so. Right. Professor John Mew may not have sorted his silt situation, but at least he hasn't given any ground on his principles. I was brought up that money mattered. And uh, therefore, you should always do what you could to save it, earn it, and not splash it about. And so basically, I'm mean. Um, but then maybe that's why I'm living in a castle. At Chavenage House, it may be the start of a new era as Caroline Lowesley Williams returns to see whether Paddy has finally taken to having a workmate in his grandson, Ryan. Hey, well, well done, Jess. What do you think of it now? It's amazing. You know, just taking out the brambles and everything, what space you've created. It's rather amazing what the yeah, older, eight, eight, the older eight, than eight. you could do, achieve in one day. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Not so much the old, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Chavenage has always had families long-serving here. And it's just nice to think that maybe we've planted a seed that the Jackson's tree can grow alongside ours, as it were. What's it like having your granddad as boss? Oh, it's okay. Yeah, he's just about bearable. <laughs> <laughs> With things set fair for the future, there's one more job for Ryan, climbing up the Chavenage Tower to raise the flag. Paddy and I decided we're too old to go up the tower. So we... <laughs> Who's gone up there then? <laughs> we asked Ryan to do Ryan, it. Uh, Ryan. So I yeah. just thought we'd get it up for the new season. Ryan! Ryan, are you up there yet? Yeah, I'm up here. OK, pull her up. Ready? Up she goes. There we are. St George for England. I'm pleasantly surprised to see how keen he was to adopt the idea of working with somebody. You can't expect to be doing everything himself. And, you know, to share it with somebody you love um, is, is fantastic. And, you know, that, it does mean that he's actually, in a way, realised that he's got to slightly pass things on. Well done! Nice to have a young, fit man about. <laughs> <laughs> In Baltimore, staffing agent Andrew Lowry has returned to see if Drew Rieger is ready to make an appointment after last night's soiree. We wanted to establish, um, I guess, who's in and who's out. Miriam, I was expecting to come back. What are your thoughts with Ryan? I think uh, Ryan did a great job. You know, he was uh, really put to the test being left largely Absolutely. alone. And again, thank Absolutely. you for coming. So would you like me to make a phone call to Ryan? I, I would. One second. Hello, Ryan speaking. Good morning, Ryan. How are you? Good morning, I'm fine. How are you? Good. So, Ryan. Last night was sort of a, a baptism of fire. I really enjoyed my time last night. Uh, uh, the guests were very nice. Uh, Mr. Rieger, he helped me out with some things. Uh, I guess the, the, the $60 million question is... Um, uh, I guess it's a thumbs up for the position. Yeah, it's something I can see myself doing. Wonderful. And thank you so very much for your time yesterday. Thank you. Not a problem. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Feel, feel great. Excited. Excited to get started. Ryan has been offered the position as Drew's housekeeper, as long as he remains happy in the job. Despite his lack of experience, uh, really listened and, and really uh, tried to understand what it was that I needed and was extremely polite. Pleasure. Thank you, Andrew, Thank for you everything so you did. You're very welcome. Thank you. I would love to mold Ryan into that, you know, a 21st century young man who, who becomes the butler. And the, Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not often you come across uh, young men like Ryan. The best exotic marigold hotel. More crumbly than they expected, but what an adventure in Jaipur for Judy Dench, Bill Nye and Maggie Smith, Saturday at 9. But next tonight, no cat cliches, but Alex Brooker and Alex Jones join Jimmy's teams for 8 out of 10. <laughs>